YouTube battle community, Who fans, random people on the internet, my name is Giggins, and today we're talking about the Who's live album, Live at Leeds, released in 1970 on Decca Records in the US, easily regarded as one of the best rock albums of all time, it's definitely up there, and for me, yeah, easily one of the best rock albums of all time, uh, live rock albums of all time. So, a little bit of backstory behind this guy here, um, throughout 1969, when the Who put out Tommy, that was the album that got them famous. So they were pretty big in England. Uh, they had a really good like cult following. They were the band that smashed up their gear and would get on TV sometimes. Um, you know, Can't Explain, My Generation, I Can See for Miles. They had a couple of really big hits over there. But in America, they were kind of like bubbling around. They weren't really super well known until the Smothers Brothers happened. Um, they did uh, I Can See for Miles and My Generation and then blew up their gear. That helped, but then 1968 was a really uh, kind of a slow year for the guys. They were on tour a lot in 1968, um, but making making your music wise, like not a whole lot came out. Like Magic Bus, the single came out with dogs on the back. Um, that was kind of it. Call Me Lightning was another song that was out there too. But for a band that was so relied so heavily on their singles in the early years, and then you know some albums too. 68 was kind of a dry spell, which we would later discover and find out that Pete was writing Tommy during that time, and they recorded Tommy, and the album exploded. You know, they were a band now that a lot of people saw as rock snobs, because they were writing stuff that was sophisticated, and there was some thought to it, and there was a story behind it. He wrote an opera. He wrote a rock opera. The least rock and roll thing you can do is write opera, an opera or tell a giant story over a two-disc set. Um, for a band that hasn't, that hadn't been like a giant success in America, it was doing fairly well for themselves in England, putting out a double album set was risky. It's risky now too, but back then, unheard of. And so, here's this really loose storyline about this kid who goes deaf, dumb, and blind because he can't talk about things that he's seen, and then discovers himself through pinball, and it's, the whole story is pretty far out, man. Um... So anyway, this thing blows up. In, in America, p people are calling them Tommy the Who because the words Tommy and then the Who were underneath it. So Tommy the Who were taking off in America. Um, and they were playing the entire album live. So their shows went from being probably like 45 minutes of their hits to opening with some hits, playing all or the majority of Tommy, um, and then closing with some hits. So their shows were averaging like two hours or like an, an hour and a half anyway. It was a really long show. So... Throughout this time, a lot of their critics and the people that were against The Who were saying things like, oh, well, you know, their, their whole thing has changed. They're no longer about being on stage and smashing up their gear. They're here to do an opera for us. And so a lot of people thought they lost their rock and roll cred. You know, the rock and roll car got taken away. Um, and I think as a callback to that, I mean, throughout 1969, The Who were recording a lot of shows. Um, in anticipation of a live album to kind of like say hey we're still us so this album Tommy sounds great but it's really polished it's really straightforward the live version of what we do is who we are um, you know that's the who live on stage and so at the end of the year they finished touring they got back to England and Pete and Bob Purden were hanging out and they were going over the idea of like how are we going to go through all these tapes how are we going to pick a show how are we going to listen to all of this material and figure out how to, you know, build a live album out of the tapes that we have. Um, and Pete was like, you know what, screw that, it's going to take way too long, just burn them. Just burn the tapes. Get rid of them. And he told Bob, look, you please burn them. I don't want them. They're gone. And so Bob was like, uh, okay. And apparently he burned some of them, but stashed away a few other ones, which at the time I think upset Pete, but years later... He was kind of like, I'm glad you saved a couple, because that was like, you know, our history. Um, so, with all those tapes in the past, they were like, you know what, we have a couple of shows lined up. We have a show at Leeds University on, on Valentine's Day, and then Hull University the next day on the 15th. Let's just record those and see what happens. And so they recorded Leeds, meant to be the kind of a warm-up, thinking Hull was going to be the, the show. And so, they did the shows. Uh, Leeds turned out really well. Hole turned out even better, apparently, that they felt it was better. But it was marred by some uh, hiccups. Like, John's bass wasn't present in a whole bunch of songs. So there was a lot of problems there. They couldn't really use those tapes. So Leeds won. 
Um, and Roger even said live at Hull just kind of sounds like a mouthful. It doesn't roll off the tongue real easy. Like live at Leeds sounds awesome. So in the spirit of the times, bootlegging was starting to become a humongous industry uh, in the rock and roll scene. You know, so many bands had unreleased material coming out into the market, which you can buy in record stores at that time. There's a great video of Neil Young going into a record store finding Neil Young bootlegs in like 1970 or 71. He's asking the guy who works behind the counter, like, what is this? Where's your manager? <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, so this was the spirit of the times. You know, the Beatles' comeback bootleg was out of all the 69 sessions in uh, early 69. Um, the Rolling Stones had a couple of them out, like Liver, uh, if you want it, or Liver, if you got it, whatever it was. But that was the inspiration for this album cover, actually, was that Liver um, bootleg. Because it was the same boring jacket with a stamp at the bottom, and it said all this, you know, the title of the album down here. So, The Who kind of liked that idea. They wanted to put out an album that looked like a bootleg to kind of fit in with the times. There was no big, glossy production. There was no really detailed, intricate artwork like Tommy had. Here's a brown sleeve, a boring brown sleeve with nothing on the back beyond the credits of Decca, And it just says The Who live at Leeds. Here's the music. This is it. It's rock music. Here it is. Um, and they even went even further as to not really clean up the tapes. So on the LP itself, it says crackling noise is okay, do not correct. Um, so they really went for like a quote unquote back to their roots aesthetic of like, here's something so simple and so pure and just us. Um, this is rock music, this is The Who. So the original idea was to put out a double album, but Pete in the end thought, you know what, let's just do a single album. Let's not even put Tommy on there because at this point they were kind of getting bored with it. They were playing it every single show for like a year or two straight. I mean, it was like non-stop playing Tommy. Um, and it, I mean, it became their anthem and like, and still is. If you ask people what their favorite music is from The Who, they might say the Tommy stuff. Um, I mean, the live version of Tommy is absolutely insane. So when this thing came out, um, a lot of critics were into it and a lot of critics were not into it, saying that like, hey, you know, um, <laughs> they were kind of slamming them, saying they were like Led Zeppelin ripoffs, because here was this really polished Tommy album, and then here's this live album uh, with really, really, uh, there's a huge focus on the guitars. The, the, the electric guitars mixed so forward in front of everything else. It's a really loud guitar album. Um, and so people were calling them Led Zeppelin. They were comparing it to Robert Plant's voice, the whole thing. Um, it's just funny looking back at those reviews now because today it's such a, no, that's just the who, that's just their evolution. That's where they, that was the next part of their phase. Um, but to be there at the time, it was just a, a different life. Um, you know, had I been there when this came out, maybe I would have felt the same way after the band had just put out songs like Magic Bus and then you get this really nice see me, feel me listening to you stuff. And then you get really heavy stuff on here. But um, this is representative of the time of The Who in this era. So you get your shaking all over. You get your summertime blues. You get your um, Magic Bus, My Generation. You know, it's a really good document of where they were at at this point. Minus all the Tommy material. Minus a few other songs that were equally as important of this era. Like John's Heaven and Hell. Um, which opened the majority of their shows at this point. But... Um, you know, for being a six track album, it's concise, it's just under 40 minutes and it really blows you away. I mean, to have heard this back in the day, I wish I could have been there when this came out because not only was this the only live album released during Keith Moon's, you know, time with the band, um, but this is like, if you hadn't gotten the chance to see The Who and this was your introduction to them, this would have blown you away. I mean, the amount of sheer rock force on this thing is undeniably cool. Um, their energy is so through the roof. Apparently, Pete had a couple of drinks, so he was a little, little drink in filled. Drink and filled? He was drink and filled. He, was, he wasn't drunk or anything, but he had a, he was a, he had a buzz going on during the Leeds show. Leeds show um, at Hull, he was pretty straight, but um, so again, they were still saying Hull was a better show, but. Their dynamic, the way they play off each other, the way they know what each other is going to do at any second, the way Roger is just commanding the stage. This was the Who at their 1970 peak, um, which, you know, throughout the 70s, they would be even better as a band. Like the 75 tour is some of the best stuff they ever did too, but this really loose, but also really tight, um, you know, feel for their music and for each other at this point is undeniably cool. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, the album itself opens up with Young Man Blues, which, you know, obviously the show started with Heaven and Hell, but for the album's sake, Young Man Blues is a fantastic opener, and this is just a classic of the era. They, they always played this song, um, but it's angry, it's powerful, it's so hungry for this, this like, yearning throughout the whole track. Um, it's super happy, it's an excellent opener, and I love the playfulness in the background of, you've seen the videos where like, you know, they'll do that start and stop stuff and Pete and Keith will look at each other and they'll end at the same point. Um, it's great. And you know, John's in the background holding everything on, holding everything down in the back. Um, just an excellent opener. The, the sharp guitars, the, the crazy drums from Keith Moon. He's just one of the best drummers of all time, if not the best drummer of all time. He's my inspiration for playing drums anyway. Um, but yeah, great way to open the album for sure. Substitute, so we get the first actual who written song on this album. Uh, it's a shorter version of the song. They cut off like the last chorus and verse um, as the studio version has, but I like the slightly echoey background vocals on this one. Pete and John are in unison for most of this thing, like playing the same kind of stuff. Um, and Keith is all over the place, which is funny because on the studio recording, he was also all over the place because he had taken a bunch of pills and apparently did not remember recording that song, uh, which is pretty funny, but. Well, I don't know if it's funny, but it's an interesting anecdote. Um, Summertime Blues, a, a classic of The Who at this time. It was also a single in both the States and the UK. Uh, it cracked the top 30 in both countries. It was number 27 in America. And I'm sorry, I think it was number 38 in the UK or 28, something like that. Um, but it did really well for themselves as a single, standalone single. Um, yeah, I mean, John's voice on this track is great doing the... You can't use a car because you did a wookalee. Believe me, I've practiced that for years in high school. I remember doing that with a band one time where I got to do those parts live. Very cool. Um, but John's bass line in this song steals the show for me. The really rubbery, bouncy bass line that just goes all over the place. So, like, where the other guys aren't playing, he's filling in those holes. So, like, just a master class of musicianship from this group. Um, but, I mean... Roger's voice just screaming this this vocal out throughout the whole thing. Um, and I love the background vocals from John and Pete in the back. I mean, it's this great track. Um, Shaking All Over, originally by Johnny Kidd of the Pirates. Their version is so good, but I love the Who's version too. Um, Roger's low growl throughout this thing when he's like, when you move in right up close to me, like the way he just growls that out um, and the way the music, you know, complements that, the way that Keith is like keeping the momentum, just kind of chugging along with the toms. And, and Pete's just like plugging away at the guitar, John's thundering away at the bass. Um, it's such a cool version of this song. Um, the way Pete hits that like vibrato with his guitar um, right before the choruses. Um, the way he, he fills it in with some guitar fills. Um, Keith is doing the same thing too. But um, really, really fun, exciting track. I mean, literally the energy does not stop at all on this album. Um, but that's what inside one you get those four tracks and inside two is just two other tracks but it's who written tracks so you get my generation and magic bus um which i think on the lp is called the magic bus which i think is great but my generation is a 15 minute long version so you get my generation and then they go into a whole bunch of jamming which incorporates elements of see me feel me naked eye um a couple of lines of this thing that roger makes up they're like coming out to get you um, Sparks is in there, Underture, some people have said that The Seeker is in there, I'm not hearing The Seeker at all, it, I mean they, they play in A a lot of the time, but that doesn't mean The Seeker is in there, um, but again it's one of those things where they take you on a journey throughout this whole thing, and it's really fun, they also do that like, I love that riff, whatever that came from, that's, that's a bloody brilliant riff, um, great, great stuff, but uh, yeah, 15 minutes, it flies by because there's so many things they incorporate throughout those 15 minutes, keeping your interest peaked the entire time. There's no dull moment, um, and there's parts where they, like, kind of taper off for a little bit, but then they jump right back into it, keeping the momentum up the entire time. Um, these guys were on fire at this point. And then Magic Bus closes this thing out, you know, Keith has the claves coming out, um, Pete's got these pretty cool sharp guitar stabs, and John's kind of, you know, thumping along. Um, years later, John, I remember reading a, a quote somewhere where John saying he, he hated playing Magic Bus Live because he was like, yeah, it was like 15 minutes of playing A over and over again, which was hilarious. Um, but then you get to the part where they, where Pete yells, she goes like thunder. Then you get this guitar slide down the strings with this pick. Uh, Keith jumps in with a really awesome riff going, or Phil going down the drums. 
Uh, John fills out the bass, and Roger comes pounding in with that harmonica and just, like, breathes the crap out of this thing. Um, and it's just, like, it sounds like an engine, like a train, just, like, chugging along down the tracks doing 100,000 miles an hour um, from a group of guys who just feel on top of the world. I mean, this was their time to shine. Like, Tommy blew them up. And here they were on stage where all these people to come see him, they were so stoked to hear this new music and this new band they just discovered. Um, and they did not disappoint. They are easily one of the best live bands of all time, and this album completely proves it. So, um, this album has been reissued time and time again um, on CD, as a single disc, as a double disc, as a box set, on, on uh HD tracks and Apple Music. I mean, it's been remastered and remixed and you name it a hundred thousand times. Um, but the original version, I think, is it's just so good on its own. It's its own little special thing. Um, there's rumors that the first 150,000 copies of this album were the only ones that had all the inserts. And of that, only 500 had the Woodstock contract, which can't be. I really feel like the Woodstock contract was part of all of those 150,000. Because if that's the case, then I have like a super extremely rare copy, and I'm not, I'm not about to... No. It's gotta be. It's an original. It's from 1970. Uh, it's got the Woodstock contract, but I... No. Um, so what they did was they packaged it in a cool gatefold sleeve. Um, the original sleeve of the LP itself was plain. Um, at one point, someone threw in a... It looks like a Columbia. What was this? Columbia record sleeve. Um, but I'll show you the record here. Very, this copy is, is a little bit scratched. This thing is well loved. Actually, it's a lot scratched. <laughs> this is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I mean, it sounds great. It plays really, really well. It's a really sturdy record. Um, but yeah, you get that simple, uh, man, I hope it shows up. We might not see it. Sorry, guys. Um, really simple white label that you can't even read on this video. Uh, but they actually wrote, you know, crackling noise is okay. Do not correct. Um, with a nice, you know, apparently written by Pete, um, on those labels. And the stuff that comes with this thing, I mean, it's loaded with stuff, which is great. You get this classic, um, marquee poster, which I absolutely love this poster. Um, I have a t-shirt of this that I got when I was 14 or 15. I still have it somewhere. It's basically on its last thread, but, uh, I've got that somewhere. But then you get cool stuff. So here's a, uh, this is a, a receipt for smoke bombs so they can blow stuff up. Um, here's a bunch of rejection letters. Um, you know, from this is from EMI saying, nah, sorry, high numbers, you're no good. Uh, oh, here we go. Here's the, um, here's the Woodstock thing, the, the Premier Talent Associates contract, the Woodstock bit. Apparently one of 500 copies. Um, this is a itinerary, uh, looks like a tour schedule for the, for, uh, April through June at some point. So that's kind of cool. Oh, this is great. You get a really nice early picture of the guys from the My Generation era. Very, very cool. Looking all mod. Um, some typed up lyrics of my, 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 my generation. Um, some more rejection letters more itineraries for the high numbers, and then this great shot of Pete. This must have been a Woodstock. Um, Pete jumping up in the air with his SG and his white jumpsuit. Uh, I also should, I should note at this point um, that during this time is when Pete started to switch over to playing SGs um, because they became a really, really versatile guitar for him. Um, they're a little easier to use for him on stage because he was playing the Ricks for a while, but he also played Fenders for a while there too. Um, but I think he found that the SG was able to give him a bunch of tones that were easier to switch between um, for the more quieter moments and the harder moments, and he was able to throw these things around and still use them over and over again. Um, he was also using those big high watt amps at this point, um, which I think he was using Marshall before that and a few other ones, Sun before that as well, but the high watt was in full effect at this point. So um, that's it. For me, this is a 10 out of 10 all day long, hands down, one of the best live albums of all time from one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, and that's it. There's nothing in the back, so I can't really show you. Not worth looking at the back, but um, yeah, that's it. Um, like I said, there's so many versions of this album that have been reissued over and over again. In the 90s, when they made the CD, the guys went back and redid some vocal overdubs, which I always thought kind of blew my mind. Um, 
and then there's been different mixes here and there and eventually with the Apple Music and HD Tracks version of it you get literally the entire show as one stream um, so that's very very cool but yeah that's it 10 out of 10 The Who Live at Leeds my name is Giggins this has been album reviews with The Who's Live at Leeds and uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video bye bye